or tutelage, we thank you. May you embrace them and hold them as they daily uh, pray, as they pray for their students, as they pray, as they open your word, as they assimilate and they begin to facilitate uh, the lessons and sometimes, many times, bringing other things in, to, uh, in, in creative ways to be able to help each one of us to be able to learn and, and pass on uh, what we are receiving. We thank you for them and we dedicate them afresh and anew to you. And we thank you in your blessed name. Amen. Thank you so much. Okay. I don't see. Is there? Okay, at this time, there will be uh, a Bible presentation. Thank you, Regine. Good morning. Um, so both of the, the um, girls that I'm presenting these Bibles to are not here today, but I'll just do like a real brief, you know, presentation. So um, the two kids that are moving from um, fifth into sixth grade this year um, is Abigail Stanton, and then it is um, Adriana Schlossnagel. So these are the Bibles that we chose for them for this year. Since we had two girls, we did something a little more specific for them. Um, and I would have them if anybody ever wants to look or anything. Um, but then these are presented to them from on behalf of the church and Christian Ed. Thank you, Rajit, so very much. Well, at this time, uh, Joyce will uh, share a mus musical response, uh, and we likewise will follow in couple moments with the doxology. Thank you, Joyce.
Our Father, we thank you through our Lord Jesus Christ that we're able to lift you up and praise you, glorify you, and express our love to you. Thank you for the gifts received today from your good hand as we return a portion back to you. We know that, that you measure and meet them out for all of your intended purpose. And we give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And the join in a wonderful Savior is Jesus. Enjoyed it immensely. Beautiful singing. Sounded wonderful. Thank you so very much, Joyce. We appreciate it very, very much. John's great to have you. It's been a couple weeks. So it's good seeing you, Brittany and Greg. And uh, thank to each one of our multimedia and those who fill in and help out. We appreciate it so very much. We'd asked, uh, uh, first of all, any joys this morning? Any joys? Answers to prayer? Oh, it's been a year already. What? Wow. Boy, time does go fast. Wow, that is a joy. Absolutely. Wow. Amen. Wonderful. We'd ask you to keep the uh, Hartmans in your prayer, uh, specifically Laura. Uh, she'll be having surgery uh, this month, October the 29th. Uh, she's having, uh, won't go into detail, but just uh, since her last surgery, there's some complications and she's experiencing some discomfort and pain uh, through that. And uh, so remember uh, Laura uh, uh, in her prayers, if you would. Uh, for uh, Faye uh, Faust, uh, uh, 
her, uh, she's great, great niece to little Danny that we prayed for, and the text that I got, uh, I guess overnight, got, we got it this morning, is she's now up to two pounds something. So she was one pound seven ounces, now she's two pounds something. So things are, are, are improving, so uh, continue to pray. That's a wonderful, wonderful answer. The family is hopeful and uh, things are moving ahead, so continue to pray for little Danny. Uh, we have been uh, for Trudy as she began uh, her clinical trials. We trust everything is moving ahead. Everything, Brittany, uh, for Trudy? Good. And uh, we've been mentioning for Terry and for Max and Jean. Uh, uh, Joy, Joy Fritz, if you remember, she was not feeling well this week, so remember her in prayer and, uh, and the others. Are there any others we need to add this morning? Okay, if not, uh, let us share together and go to the Lord in prayer. Our loving Father, we do thank you so much for the opportunity to come to you in prayer through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's all because of you that we're able, because you're the only mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. But you, Lord, have shown us the way. You indeed are God, and that you uh, show us because you are the exact reputation. You're the very, as we talked last week, Lord, in the very nature, the very form. And yet, uh, in the midst of that, you know us, and you care about us, and you love us, and you are there. And we pray your indelible touch and healing and strength for Trudy. Lord, thank you for Danny and, and uh, uh, giving her strength and helping her to gain some weight. And, and Lord, for the attention of the team and doctors, may that continue, and may it continue with Trudy. May everything... Lord, as we believe from you that a miracle is always possible. And Lord, we pray that the discomfort, the pain may ease. We pray that the healing uh, will uh, lift the heights that we, that we can never think, imagine. But we know because we lean and trust you that it is possible. We love her and we just pray your best and, and the outcomes will be positive. We thank you uh, this day so very much for each that we mentioned. Uh, for Terry and Max and Jean, for Hazel and Ken. We uh, remember Levon uh, and Ken's daughter, Jennifer. Uh, Lord, we're trusting. We haven't heard, but we are continue to pray uh, for Jennifer uh, that, uh, that everything is improving, things are moving ahead, and uh, she's experiencing, Lord, uh, less effects of the cancer. May it be shrinking, and uh, we'll give you the praise. And also for, for uh, Levon's uh, uh, sister, uh, Jan Jan Janet Pr Pritz, we uh, pray as well for her. She's been battling this for probably over a year. And we pray to her, Lord, that you'll be tender with her and uh, that it, she's experiencing wonderful good news and healing as well. We do thank you so much for, for Anne and JT and the family. We, we love uh, Bailey and can't believe it's been a year, but we just thank you so very much. Lord, for your provision, for your wonderful into the lives of, of families, and particularly for JT and Ann. We rejoice in that, and we're seeing the, the wonderful uh, uh, Bailey and the energy and just life, full of life, and it's just great to see, and thank you for the blessing. May just many, many, many in, in commit to you. Thank you this day, Lord, for each one, for our congregation, for each, for our young people, and help them, Lord, and in a very trying and difficult uh, time, uh, help them to be able to gain the things that they need, that there might still be in the midst of, of, of the learning that's different, but yet uh, that it will come forth and help those that, that may be uh, having dif difficulty adjusting to the changes, and that in the midst of that, that we'll uh, experience uh, for our families what is needed. Continue to be with our leaders and help them in the midst of, of things as uh, there's still a, a, a dichotomy, so to speak. Uh, and so we pray that uh, you will give them wisdom and understanding and help them in the midst of it to be able to, to clearly pass on things uh, that will help uh, us to get back to those things that are needful in our nation. We pray this day uh, that for our community, as we think so many uh, uh, are hurting and need your, your care, and uh, even it emanates from, emanates from, from uh, Somerset Church of the Brethren to reach out and assist others and help them. Continue to be with those who are serving 
Uh, Lord, for our firemen and policemen, first responders, many other agencies that do a great work. Help them to be able to, to uh, function and to move ahead. Help them that uh, the needs will be made known so that those critical agencies will continue to be able to serve in our community. Lord, we uh, thank you as we think not only leaders in our community, but we pray for our president. We pray for those that in the House and the uh, Senate and all those that uh, make decisions and that, that affect the lives of so many in our country. Continue to give them, as you say in 1 Timothy chapter 2, that, that the, the very atmosphere can change of situations when we pray. And if we don't pray, no wonder things don't change. So we pray that uh, you'll be with our leaders and, and you'll change their uh, hot thoughts and that, their desires that may run contrary and counter to the things that, that are needful, that, Father, that uh, you may impress upon them. And they're there, they're willing to do that. Lord, this day, what an opportunity that we have every day to draw near to you, to pray and to seek you, but how wonderful to join together as a fellowship. Lord, today, may your Holy Spirit uh, Lord, uh, uh, just signify and, and uh, uh, make known those things that we need for our life and heart. We commit this all to, the, to you, O oh Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'm so glad that you're here today, and uh, we are continuing in uh, our study of the book of Philippians. This morning, we're in chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, and I asked you if you would stand together, stand, uh, join with me in uh, reading two verses of, of Scripture. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Let us share together and read out loud and together. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. You may be seated, and as always, God's word is a great blessing. I'm going to ask you today to put your uh, thinking pack caps on. I encourage you to have your Bible, and I ha ask some individuals to read some scripture this morning. So it will be an interactive a little bit, and uh, so I believe at the outset when I... Uh, proposed and uh, Philippians study, that would be a little different, we'll do some different things, and so uh, I thank the individuals who share today, I appreciate that so very much. Uh, several years ago, uh, in London, Ig England, uh, the city was besieged with constant complaints regarding Lund London's transit authority system. It, it seemed that uh, the uh, buses would uh, tend to go right past the bus stops while customers were waiting, were standing in line waiting to be picked up. And because of the barrage of, of complaints, they were called upon to answer that. And their statement that they made became an infamous statement all across of public service uh, transit authorities across uh, the world. And the statement read this, uh, it is impossible for us to maintain our schedules if we have to constantly stop and pick up passengers. What's wrong with that statement? Anyone? What's that? Okay, that's true. And you want to add just a little, add a to that. What? Okay, yeah, you're, you're all correct, yes. George is correct. But what, yeah, what do the schedules matter? Do they really matter if, if they're not serving their purpose? And what's the purpose? To pick up passengers. That's the reason. Last week, we talked about Christ's attitude having this same attitude that's in Christ Jesus, that we should have that attitude. Today we're looking at Christ in working out the actions that we should have. So we need first that initial, and then 
our actions that, that follow in the midst of it. it uh, you'll see up there, I think, that biblical knowledge without applied learning will leave a Christian frustrated and ineffective for proper spiritual growth. And so as we celebrated Christian education today, it's important that we not only have knowledge, but teachers want to what? Make sure that their students, whether at Somerset Church of the Brethren, the Sunday School to, uh, arm of the church, or in other learning exercises and enterprises, that what we are receiving that we're passing on. And the same is for you as well, that knowledge is important, but that knowledge that we're receiving isn't going to help us if we don't pass on what we're learning. In fact, sometimes teachers and those that go through, they learn as well because they're working through the subject and they're learning and passing on that. Well, today we're going to focus, and there are three main points. Let me give first of all that we are that we are to first work out your salvation. And secondly, you are to shine out your standards and you are to pour out your sacrifice. We're going to focus this morning on just verse 12 and 13. And so at a later, we'll, we'll talk about those other two. But uh, George Mueller, in years gone by, in generations gone by, was noted as a prayer warrior. And he was one time a person, as he was at a conference, and at the end of the conference, uh, someone came up to George Mueller and said, I, I admire your, your praying, and I would so much love to have the discipline that you are uh, affirming and exercising in your life. And I, I, I would ask, that, would you pray for me, that, that I would be a, a person of prayer? And uh, George Mueller said, I, I certainly would. But he said, here's what I, I asked you to do. I want you to set the alarm, and when you set the alarm, I want you to get one leg out of bed. And when you get one leg out of bed, I'll pray God that you get the other leg out. And a lot of that is like that, isn't it? That we desire and things we want to do, and there's an aspect that we've got to do. And then we trust God <laughs> for, for the other. And that's what we're talking about. Work out your salvation. And so today, uh, in just a few moments, I'll ask some individuals to read uh, some scriptures that enforce what are the other of this theological tension, right? There's a tension between these two things. I want you to note uh, in here that, first of all, this is addressed to Christians. This is addressed to believers. We already saw in the first chapter that Paul was writing to all the saints. So he's obviously writing not to unbelievers. He's writing to believers. And it, and it mentions in chapter 1 that my brethren... And in chapter 2 that we began to read in verse 13, therefore my dear brethren. So he's talking to believers in here. And there's a, there's a sense in here as he begins to talk to the Philippian believers that they began to rely a little bit too much on him. You see, it says that they obeyed the teaching. Now let me ask you, what teaching did they obey? Well, the, the teachings of Paul, right? Which come the teachings of Christ, but the teachings of Paul. In other words, the Philippian believers were a high spot in Paul's life. What Paul had taught them, they had obeyed and put into practice. And that's what he's affirming to, to them in here. Therefore, as you always have obeyed, not only in my presence, but how much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. They, they began to rely on him a little bit. So that's why they inquired so much as Paul was in prison. You understand, right? Paul is in Rome. Rome Philippi is a Roman colony. We talked about that at the outset. And so Philippi is a Roman colony. Paul's in the dungeon, and he's writing a letter of joy and encouragement. And so... They began to obey and put in practice what Paul taught them, and now since he's absent from them, they're, they're concerned about him, which rightly would be proper, right? And so they begin to inquire, how's he do doing? That's why they wanted Epaphroditus to go and find out how he's doing, and because he had loved them, he had nurtured them, he helped them to grow in their faith. 
And so, yes, they maybe relied a little bit too much on him, but they were concerned about him. And that's why he responds to that. And that's why Epaphroditus was sent to, to take care, not only of Paul's need, but to report back to the believers in the assembly how Paul was faring and how he was getting on. Now this phrase here, there's a verb in here that's important, but you see, work out your salvation. And this tension here is, some people believe there's a contradiction. Some believe there's a, a tension between human responsibility and God's sovereignty. Uh, many uh, uh, colleges and seminaries and Christians have battled over the sense of how much am I responsible for? How much is my responsibility and how much is God's responsibility? And note in here in verse, in cha- in verse 12 of chapter 2, it says, work out your salvation. So there's a sense of responsibility to begin to work it out. That we have a responsibility. That we just don't sit and just wait to go to heaven. That we're just going to coast along in our life. But we should be doing something. But then verse 13 says, But it's God who works in you to will and to do for his good purpose or his good pleasure. And that seems to be God's working, right? In the midst of it. Let me uh, read a little thing it says here that a cute little one, you can, just a thought. Once upon a pew I sat and I heard the preacher ask, we need someone to teach a class. Now who will take this task? And God sat down beside me there and he said, son, that's for you. But Lord, to stand before a class is one thing I can't do. Now Bill would be the man to call. There's nothing he won't do. I'd rather hear the lesson taught from here upon my pew. Once upon a pew I sat, and I heard the preacher ask, we need someone to lead the songs, now who will take this task? Then God sat down beside me, and there said, son, that's for you. Oh, but no, Lord, to sing before a crowd, that's one thing I can't do. Now, Brother King, he'll do the job, there's nothing he won't do. I'd rather hear the music played upon my pew. Once upon a pew I sat, and I heard the preacher ask, I need someone to keep the door. Now, who will take this task? God sat down beside me there and said, Son, that's for you. But I replied, replied saying things to strangers, Lord, that's just I, I, one thing I can't do. Now, Tom, he can talk to people. Lord, there's nothing he won't do. I'd rather someone come to me and greet me on my pew. As years uh, just seemed to pass me by, I heard that voice no, no more. Until one night I closed my eyes and woke on heaven's shore. T'was four of us together there to face eternity. And God said, I just need three of you to do a job for me. Oh, Lord, I cried, I'll do the job. There's nothing I won't do. But Jesus said, I'm sorry, friend, in heaven there's no pew. Just a thought, just a thought. So we're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. So there's a theological difference here, isn't there? But there really isn't. But there are some scriptures that enforce both human responsibility, what we we're responsible, right? We have to do our heavenly homework, correct? So I'd ask Virginia, would you uh, read a, a, and then I'll ask, that after she reads I'd ask that you say, is that human responsibility? Is that our responsibility or God's sovereignty? When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. That's Acts 13, 48. Okay. Human responsibility or God's sovereignty? No, anybody want to venture out? Appointed to eternal life. In fact, I have a hard time with that. That's one that we studied and said, wait a minute. That, God's sovereignty, correct? Appointed to eternal life. It lends that we don't even have a place and part in that. In other words, God God chose and the others, you you lost out, (laughs) right? Isn't that what, if you read that just as that's what it seems to say. In other words, you're chosen, you're appointed, and others aren't. Well, that's not really what it says. But that's, 
But that lends on God's side, doesn't it? That is his working. Uh, Dave? For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, 13. Okay. Yeah, hu yes. Human responsibility. Whosoever calls, right? Responsibility for us that we need to, we need to receive. We, we've got to do something in the midst of it. And uh, Cindy? The Son of Man will go and has been decreed, but woe to the man who betrays him. Okay. Thank you, Cindy. And Luke, what? Luke 22, 22. I, I shouldn't do this, but that verse has both of them in. So, the former and the latter. What's, what is the former and what is the latter? Re read that once again, if I could ask you. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. God. Yes, the first one's God. And the second one is human. Right, yes. Very good, yes. So it seems that the outside, at the outset, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, the working, working out, and for it is he who goes in. It seems there's a co contradiction that God has brought about salvation, but it behooves us we must do something. So he provided salvation. But let me ask, are all people saved and going to heaven? Are all people saved and going to heaven? Why not? God died on the cross for all people. What's that? They won't accept it. They have to, yeah, they have to do something had a friend in, in college who was married. I wasn't married in the first year of college, uh, and, uh, and then soon I saw Barb. <laughs> that changed everything. Yeah. So that's now, you asked me again that's something, because I saw Barb walking around, but nothing really, you know, I didn't notice that much, and then all of a sudden it changed. So I don't know where that came from, but it did. <laughs> she noticed me right away. That's a story, yeah. That's a terrible story. She noticed... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, had a, fr fr a fellow, a wonderful singer uh, that sang uh, first tenor in the Conestogans. He was married, and, uh, and I think, he, I think he, at that place he did have, at least had one child, I think. And very wonderful singer, great guy, he's a friend, and uh, he didn't believe that he needed to get life insurance for his family. And I said, well, you know. So wait, wait a minute. You, yes, you should. No, no, God will, God will take care of everything. And I said, well, yes, he does, but you know the script. Don't you know that if we don't provide for our family, Paul told Timothy, if you don't provide for your family, you're worse than an unbeliever. You, you have some responsibility. You, God isn't going to provide life insurance. You know? So trying to encourage him, but you have, you've got to do that. We're, we have to do our human homework. You know, and I said, well, aren't you taking classes here? Yeah. I said, well, you know, are you just hoping you'll fall into some course that you chose the right courses and you'll fall into a career? Is that how it, or are you going to do your earthly homework and choose the things according to your gifts and that and all that? Because you're, you know, you're, you're paying your own way, right? Like I was paying the way. So you want to make sure you're doing that, but you're trusting God in the midst of that. Right? And uh, so he goes, oh, I see a point in that. And that can apply to our young people. And you're saying as you desire for uh, what you're going to do with life, and should I go to college, right? Or should, I, should I go into vocational? Where should I go? Do, do you just say, well, I'm just going to hope I fall into this and it will work out? Or do you do your homework and you trust God for that? It can happen in many areas. Employment can happen spiritually. Do I cultivate myself spiritually, or do I just let God do it? So there's that tension in that. I believe we have to 
spiritually cultivate ourselves. It isn't going to happen by happenstance. It's not going to happen, say, well, God will, God's going to grow me. We have to take that, and I, you know that. Each of you that are part of the church here, those of you especially that we acknowledge as teachers, you see the vital part of others having those things that will help them grow and know about God and begin to uh, exhibit those things in their life and in their heart. And so work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good pleasure. Now, there's a uh, little verb in here, and I'm moving fast here, but there's a verb in here that sometimes we don't see, and that verb in there is an imperative. All it means is simply it's a command. It's not optional. When Paul says that we as believers, telling the Philippian believers and to us years later, work that salvation out. In other words, continue. Uh, Calvin, would you read Colossians, I think, 2.6? So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. Okay, continue. Continue to work it out, right? Continue that process. In fact, in further down here, we're not getting in this morning, Paul has in mind the children of Israel leaving Egypt and going to the promised land, to Canaan. In other words, Paul is referring, to thinking in his mind of the children of Israel. In other words, there's a process from Egypt to Canaan, from the deliverance, leaving Egypt as bond, in bondage servants, and coming to Canaan. There's a working out. Continue to work it out. So that verb is also an imperative, a command, but it's present tense, which means work it out now. Work out your salvation. Don't, and don't, don't just work it out now and forget about tomorrow. Work it out today. Continue to work it out to completion, to the, the finishing line. See, some people, they think, well, I'm saved, and that's it, right? I'm saved, and that's it. No, we are to work it out. It's a process to it. Note also that we, we are not to work on our salvation, nor are we to work in the salvation, right? Because there's not anything we can do. That may seem redundant, but, but we have to continue to say that. We cannot do anything for salvation, as Paul said in Roman, Ephesians chapter 2, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So salvation is all of God's. But as we say, as some of you said, we've got to receive it. We've got to do something in the midst, midst of that. And so work that salvation out to completion. Work, work it out. But notice, and let me ask you, why is there, as we close up, why is there fear and trembling? So work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why with fear and trembling? Just, just the thought. And why with that? It seems that Paul is saying that I'm to work out my salvation, I'm to do something and work this out. There's a process of growth in my life. I'm not working it out to keep it, mind you. I'm not working it out to keep it. I'm working it out to grow, to receive that high calling in Christ Jesus, to grow in our faith. We, that's our responsibility to grow. But why with fear and trembling? Oh, it seems to be that God wants me to work it out, but as I work it out, there's an awareness that I can't do it. Does it I don't see any other. It seems to be that we're working it out, but we ultimately can't do it ourselves. I think that's what Paul is saying in here. There's a uh, verse, and that's why I asked you to put on your thinking caps today. In, in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, Paul said, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. It seems that, that the awareness that Paul's bringing is that the desires that he has in his life, that, that he wants to do the same that what God has in his life. 
how do I put this? When I was the first a Christian, I, uh, I was afraid to ask God, to, to ask God, what do you want me to do with my life? What, what, where do you want me to go? I was afraid to ask him that. Do you know why? Because I was afraid he was going to send me to Africa. And that's and not Johannesburg. Uh, and he was not, you know, not sending me to the Holiday Inn. I was afraid he was going to send me to the hut, you know, where the drums beat. I, no, truthfully, I did. I thought, if I say, Lord, I'll go wherever you want me to go, as an 18-year-old young man, I, I didn't pray that. It was later on I did. Later on at college, I, I'll go wherever you want me to go. Now, I didn't know where I'm going to go. And you see, my desire back there was I was afraid, well, if I tell God this, he's going to send me where I don't want to go. But you see, that was immaturity. Here's the thing. The truth of the matter, God's not going to send me, he's not going to send you somewhere that you're not going to be equipped, that you're not going to be happy, that you're going to be miserable. See, I thought if I go to Africa as an 18-year-old, I'll be miserable. There's no way. I'll come on. I'm not going to do that. Now, Barb, I think, wanted to go at her early. She wanted to go to missions and go over. And uh, that got changed, didn't it? What I mean is, and later on then, the desires start to change. You see, I'm not going to Africa, but it came to be as I'm praying and asking God, all of a sudden, God knows what he wants. God's but he's not going to thrust that. He's not going to force that, is he? He's not forcing it. And sometimes the desires, you don't even know when you commit to them and th he'll lead and make his desires your desires. And so I didn't know where God wanted, but I began to do the human work. I began to get involved in various things at college and teaching and that and a church that we were going and do an internship. And you, you have to do the things and from there, God is working. So it's that little word here. Note that little word, for, F-O-R. For it is God who works. See, that little word for is the, is the difference between the responsibility and God's sovereignty. For it is God who works in you. There's no way we can work out and grow in the way we should do without God working in us. It's God working in you loving you, tenderly speaking to you, helping you in the midst of that. We can't work out this. We can't grow as we need to do without God in our life. And the more you let him in there, you're going to grow. And you're going to find those things of the Lord precious. You're going to take part in things that others don't. Not because you're better, I'm better than anyone else, because God has, is working. And those desires now that are his now becomes your desires. So Paul says, when I came to you, I didn't come to you with superb speaking and teaching and preaching. He came with an awareness of humility, an awareness that he couldn't do it. He didn't come with persuasive words, but God gave him that desire. So as I said today, we are to work it out. But as you continue to grow, let God Bring that to fruition in your life every day. Continue to learn. Pass on those things that you're learning in the midst of it. Today is kind of just a teaching part of it. But I pray today that you, that you have that desire. I believe each one of you have a living relationship with him. God wants you to grow. Would you, would you allow that? Would you take part of various things within our church? Many of you do. But allow God to do those things. Many of you are taking, willing to do things in service that others don't see. But sometimes there's tasks, isn't there, that people say, oh, I can't do that. That's why I led that, that little thought there. That there, there are things God may want you to do. And if he's kind of just nudging you, right, just that. Let God do that. Let him in that freedom. I, I acknowledge today, and I appreciate every one of you, some of you are doing one, two, and three different things and, uh, because you're gifted in many, many. And God honors that. And God one day, 
right? We're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. We all long to that. And so that's a wonderful encouragement, isn't it? Because it helps us. Because we don't do it for ourselves. We do it for those around us, and we do it that God will get the glory. Heavenly Father, thank you this day. Lord, a little bit of theological things, but we pray in the midst of it, we see the importance of that we, we are, have a part. But also in the midst of doing our part, we feel inadequate to really work it out. But it's because you're in there loving us, helping us grow. It's your presence, it's your Holy Spirit that is bringing those things to fruition that's needed to bring glory to you in your name. Amen. Would you join me in closing by standing and sharing in uh, Trust and Obey, the first, third, and fourth stanzas. the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of his spirit may it not only be with you today but each day as you walk as you grow as you love him more and more amen